So, um, so if what what I'll do is I'll start off with uh, making a small assumption. Let's let's take uh, for granted um, that you are not the site owner or the team that's actually built the site. Uh, how do you look at a site and figure out what are the areas of improvement? What are the things that you should watch out for? And um, you know things that are working great, things that need improvement, and and so on. Um, one of the first things I do is, if possible, um, ask the site owners what the backend stack is. And sometimes I think you 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 would have firsthand experience in this. You'll get a mixed bag of responses. Sometimes um, you get all the information. Sometimes uh, the information is partial. Um, a good tool to get you started uh, with this is uh, BuildFit. That's, I think, uh, always been my first, uh, you know, stop. Uh, so for this session, we asked our friends and we had a couple of, uh, you know, uh, opt-in sites where uh, we were able to, you know, do some audits and analysis and show you how you can do this for your own site. So, um, for example, if you are looking at the news laundry site, um, you don't know what the backend stack is. You can go to builtwith.com and, um, you know, see what, is the stack that it's using. It'll give you some good information. Like for example, you know that News Laundry has Google Analytics. What that means is you can ask uh, the site owner, hey, uh, can I get some uh, data on uh, end user performance or the real user metrics? Um, that you know that it's at least being measured and there is a possibility to get that information. Uh, similarly, I think uh, there's one signal um, you know, there's, there's Facebook, something to do with Facebook. There's a Google Tag Manager. Um, and and I think, uh, you know, uh, I would, there's just like, for example, Twitter, Jake Perry. I would always take this with a pinch of salt because sometimes built with is accurate. Sometimes it's not. But it gives you a good idea of where, you know, a starting point. Um, you, you know that, um, uh, you know, like for example, uh, this site has um, it's it's using Cloudflare for example. So these are things you know it it quickly gives you. I'll talk about how you can get into these um, aspects in detail. Quick question on this, Satya. I have used this tool often, and 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 people get really surprised that oh, such a tool exists out there which can read my technology. Uh, can uh, you briefly explain how does this tool work uh, internally? Very briefly, not not in depth. And, and should it be a cause of concern if someone is able to find out these things uh, uh, for any business owner? Also, as a side note, did the light just go off from at your end? I can't take a look at you. That's yes, it has. Uh, there's a path that uh, okay, cool. I think the backup Let's will kick in in a minute. So um, I think to start off with, it's it's not a concern. Anything that shows up on BuiltWith is uh, what's actually loaded on your page. And um, between that, the kind of JavaScript that's being used or, uh, you know, the servers that you're connecting to, that's essentially the information or signals that, you know, this tool uses to figure out what the tech stack is. And I can actually walk you through some of them. Google Analytics, there will be a JavaScript which you've included for Google Analytics. It's able to read it on your pages and, you know, specifically the, the URL that we put in, which was the homepage of News Laundry. So it's able to say, okay, fine, Google Analytics is there. And uh, it's able to get a little more in term, you know, details on what kind of analytics you're using simply by looking at what JavaScripts and what function calls you're making. Similarly, you know, Facebook and all of that. One signal, again, you would you would include either the SDK service worker or a JavaScript for one signal. And that's, uh, that's show, showing up because, uh, you've included some component, which even if um, I have a Chrome browser, I can open up the dev tools and figure it out if I know exactly what I was looking for. Um, Tag Manager, all of this works the same way. Uh, if you go to some of the backend stacks, I, I think everything that shows up on front end is uh, self-explanatory, but you know, what about things like GoDaddy DNS? That's because your site you know, is hosted on a name server and I can get that information by just looking up the site. Uh, there is a record, that, the NS record will tell you what DNS provider you're using. Uh, Broadly, this is all public post... information, right? So this so essentially yes. it boils down to everything that it is showing is public information. Uh, there is no hacking going on around here. No, uh, it, it's all based on signals that, you know, it shows up on your site and it's public. Right. Okay, so once you, get a sense of what are the different tech stacks. Um, the next thing you want to do is try and figure out 
you know, um, uh, okay, what the site is, you might want to go to the homepage itself. Like for example, here, you might just want to go to um, newslaundry.com, figure out um, what exactly is the content of the site. Uh, that's important because sometimes if you don't know uh, what kind of site it is, it's, it's hard to figure out what you should be looking for. Um, and uh, the other thing that you want to keep in mind, and, and this is important for uh, different kinds of sites, uh, most of the sites will have page templates. Um, it's especially true for publication or blogs or, you know, even in e-commerce, you have a home page where, uh, you know, you lift, uh, list all your top items, then you have a product page and you have a category page. That concept is actually common across different classes of website. In a blog, you have your home page, you have your categories and you have a post um, in, in um, news publications, you have something similar. Even for, uh, you know, uh, sites that don't fall into these categories, as a site owner or a developer, you know the different templates you've used. Uh, that's important. And uh, we'll use, uh, you know, uh, the, the different templates as a good starting point. Now, once you've identified the templates here, the way I went about it is homepage is definitely a template because it's, uh, in most cases, unique. Um, you know, you can go to report, it, it shows up um, as, a link on the home page. So when I go to it, it, it has a list of stories. So that seems uh, unique. And uh, if I go into one of these stories, you know, it, it's likely going to have a single story. And, and you can you can see that each of these um, have some different page templates. So we'll use this as a starting point. Now, what you want to do is uh, you, know, you can you can start off with web page test and um, <clears throat> What you want to do is do a visual comparison. Now, what I, the first just, thing I would like to do. Just wait a minute do, there. What is web page test, Wes? Okay, that's that's a good question. <laughs> so, um, web page test is a tool that uh, I would use um, to load up pages and figure out how a page is getting loaded on a Chrome browser or a Firefox browser from different locations, and dig deeper into uh, what's showing up. What does that mean and um, interpretation of that data? So it's a very visual tool, which um, sort of uh, helps you break down the performance and, and some of the other key data points to uh, to you for any URL that's publicly accessible. And, and why should we trust this tool? There are hundreds of them on the market. Sure. Uh, in fact, you don't have to use web page test at all. Web page test is just one that makes it easy for you. It's it's freely available and it has multiple agents across the globe. You can, in fact, use your developer tools on Mozilla, uh, uh, Firefox, and you know Google Chrome. Um, that works as well. Except it works on your local browser. You would want to uh, you know simulate what it looks like when you're uh, making requests from different geographies. It, it doesn't really matter much, but if you have any geo-based logic on your site, or if you don't want to test from local, or you want to share these results with somebody else, uh, you would yeah, use something yeah. like a web page, a web page test. Right, right. These um, are a very common use cases. Yeah, and uh, the, the important thing to note about web page test is you don't have to, uh, it's, a, it's an open source offering. You don't have to use the publicly available web page test instances. You can deploy your private instance in, um, you know, Amazon or uh, GCP and, and run as many tests as you want. In fact, that's one of the easiest ways to run bulk tests. So if you want to run hundreds of thousands of tests, that's, uh, you know, the best way you would do it because these public instances will throttle you. <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, what I was saying is once you identify the different categories, you would you would come in and First thing you want to do is do a visual comparison between you know your different pages. Uh, you want to um, either take the different categories and um, run a visual comparison, or do something a little more interesting. You know that uh, if if uh, you're a website today, your top browsers are Chrome, um, and depending on the region, it's Safari or Firefox, right? Uh, for the most part, or your browser is a Chromium-based browser which behaves very similar to uh, Google Chrome, and uh, you know um, uh, you would you would like to see how your page loads up. Now, what I've done is uh, when you actually submit a test, it takes about a minute, minute and a half to uh, complete the test and show up the results. So 
I've done these tests ahead of time. And um, essentially, once the test is complete, um, the URL would change to something like this, which is, um, you know, basically the test. Can you, can you just show uh, kicking this, uh, how to initiate this test once and what is to be filled in which part of the fields? Are we doing the advanced testing or the visual comparison? Sure. So I think um, in almost all cases, uh, the inputs are the same. Here you can just say, uh, it's a label. You can just say, I want to test in Firefox. And uh, I mean, what are the options it gives out there? So it, there is a label, there is a URL, uh, and uh, you can use, what are the test configurations available? Sure. Um, okay. So when you're doing the visual comparison, um, you'll notice that there is an option to add the label. So you can go to news laundry, uh, news laundry page and uh, put in, you know, the home page. And, um, you know, we were discussing earlier, we are going to do the comparison between that and reports. Uh, this is a category. So it's a category template. So we put that in and we want to pick up a story as well. So we just, I'm just picking up the first story. Yeah. I, I would um, say don't start that. Uh, 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 actually, you can start the test. You'll have the older one cache, right? I hope this is not, <laughs> not kill yeah, the cache yeah. of the older one. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the configuration available when you're doing a visual comparison straight off the bat is just whether you want to test it on a mobile 4G desktop or um, you know a, a throttled 3G connection. So basically, it's cases, doing a combination between a, a type of device and the speed of connection, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can go ahead and kick start the test. Um, you'll see that you know this is what I was talking about. It it has to finish all of these tests. Now we can let that bake, um, but. What I usually do is, um, you know, suppose if I had to uh, do the same thing, um, I don't use the visual comparison option. Um, I use the advanced testing and I select the test location. I, you know, uh, oh, this is a site which is more relevant in India because right now I'm based out of Bangalore. So I want relevant results for me. Um, I'll select location as India, uh, Mumbai, uh, the, the Mumbai India web page test offers only Chrome and Firefox. It does not offer Safari. There are some locations, I think, which offer, you know, Opera. I think there's one that offers, oh, okay. These are three options. Okay. So right. essentially in the advanced testing, now we have far more options. We not only are going between device and connection speed, but now you can decide which location the, the test is going to run on which browser the test is going to run on. Plus there is a device angle and the speed angle, right? Uh, the, the other two. Yes, there's a device angle speed and, and speed itself uh, is broken down into, uh, you know, your latency and throughput. Uh, for but, example, if you look at. But tell me Satya, what's wrong in running the tests on your own uh, computer? Uh, why, are, why do we need so many combinations or options? Uh, no, you can. Um, so sometimes, by that uh, I mean, by that I mean that why why do we need to go C three three G four G and all those things? Why are so many options relevant essentially? Okay, so whenever you're building sites, right? I think it's important to understand that right now, um, you know, the faster internet connections are available to a fraction of your end users. Um, even if you know you cater to a niche that's uh, affluent and and they're expected to have good internet connections, even in that case you can expect the last mile connectivity to be choppy, or you should at least build for it. Um, you can always assume that there will be failures or throttling, or the last mile connectivity is poor because either your 4G is bad or your you know bad signal area, or even if it's Wi-Fi, it's it's Wi-Fi is not all that reliable. Uh, so. I think it's important for site owners to build for the worst case. And here, um, you know, at least when you're doing, you know, this type of analysis it's important to understand how your site will load up for uh, a user who's opening it on a 4G connection or a 3G connection, because you might be sitting, you know, uh, in, in Delhi or Bangalore, um, you might be having like 200 Mbps connection and, you know, you can open your site. It just opens up in a, in a second or two, but that's not really relevant. It's not going to. 
as as a site creator myself i can completely vouch for the fact that all approvals happen on clients own computers and on their own uh, uh, internet connection uh, and most uh, client internet connections and the computers uh, are obviously coming from really privileged spaces uh, and and uh, and at that point of time uh, it's really catering to probably 1% of the users and the 99% of the users uh, how they experience the website is something that uh, often never passes through a client's uh, uh, computer uh, like knowledge awareness and uh, uh, at that point of time which is why probably this this is something uh, uh, kind of can even help a client in case they are a little tech savvy or maybe ask the developers to make sure to test across all these variations as well and and maybe create a report out of this yeah yeah look I, i'll i'll be very candid so it so when when you're looking at uh, end user performance um web page test is not the kind of data you should be looking at uh, yeah. web page test is a tool that should be used primarily in the developers uh, pipeline uh, that is yeah. when he's uh, optimizing performance or tweaking the website or when you're looking to understand you know what the ballpark is like is is my site doing really really well um do i need to make improvements or where do i stand in terms of you know comparing with competition um those are the three scenarios where you should really use this and all of these are um you know guidelines only uh, take it with a lot of salt uh, because none of these uh, results will be accurate if you really need to figure out how uh, end users perceive your site i think you need to collect uh, real user monitoring data or rum data as we call it mm -hmm. this is data from end users browsers as they visit your site that is the right data set to be looking at for performance and um, i'll be walking you through some data sets that are publicly available um, you know after after we go over some parts of web page test to try and understand i, I think i have it. i have uh, derailed you from where you were going so if you want to generate the first result let's go and generate it should we do that before looking at the advanced analytics sure um, what i'm going to do is in the interest of time i'm, I'm going to quickly skip to uh, some some pre baked results um, so that we can we can quickly uh, you know skip past uh, uh, waiting for the test and and setting up the test um, you know if if you have questions on how you want to set up advanced test uh, put them in the chat or as a question i can answer that particular question okay so once um you know like i said uh, you can you can do this comparison test either between different browsers or between different uh, page templates and that's important because you need to understand how your own site performs on different browsers uh, is there you know a single browser which uh, your site behaves differently on that's important because you might be testing on chrome all the time but if something is wrong on firefox you will never know um, and um, you know uh, web page test gives you that quick um, you know view into what your site is looking at in different browsers and um, it's actually easy to sort of visualize as well so in this test we have firefox uh, in the top row and chrome in the second row and we are looking at the uh, you know home page now straight off the bat you know we can see that um, we are looking at dom complete which means that all the resources have been loaded and and uh, loaded in the sense um, all the resources have been downloaded to the browser and the the dom tree of the page has been completed um, and uh, for that event to sort of uh, trigger on web page test at least uh, there is a slight difference um, you know chrome finishes in 5.4 seconds and uh, firefox takes 6.3 seconds now that in itself it tells me nothing uh, so <clears throat> there are a few things you can do um, you can look at uh, what's exactly getting loaded now each of these browsers have different uh, you know uh, ways in which they load content uh, especially if your site uses http2 connections or you know going forward http3 the priority of different resources are different uh, you can actually visualize a lot of that uh, in these tests um, you know when you're looking at these tests individually like for example if you want to go to the firefox test 
um, you can open that up separately and figure out, you know, um, how uh, each of your um, resources on the site are being loaded. Um, for example, I think this section of the page. Uh, um, you Satya, can... Before you dive into this, can I ask you to just explain the the, uh, the this visualization for us once, uh, just an overview uh, before we get into the individual requests. Sure. So uh, what you're seeing here is a waterfall of all the requests that actually happen on a browser. So when a browser is making a request, it's actually uh, what's happening is your HTML page gets downloaded first. The next thing that happens is in your HTML page, the head uh, section of your uh, of your website uh, is passed. The, the browser figures out all the links in your head section, which is mostly blocking CSS, critical JavaScript, uh, and maybe a fab icon. In an ideal scenario, those are the three things that that usually exist in the head section. Um, and once that's downloaded, the body uh, of uh, the HTML is parsed, and you know, as and when it encounters different resources, it, it gets downloaded and executed. Um, over here, what we are seeing is <clears throat> something similar, um, and and um, you know, this visualization is color coded, right? Um, uh, and and you know, there's a there's a legend on top. Basically, this blue essentially means it's it's HTML. As you can see, there are only two piece of uh, HTML that's that's likely getting loaded. I think this is uh, this is HTTP. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, the orange ones are JavaScript. As you can see, at least on news laundry site, heavily relies on uh, JavaScript. There are a bunch of JavaScripts um, that that get uh, downloaded and executed. Uh, it it tells you a couple of things. Maybe the site is uh, built with Node.js. Uh, I think. Beltwith told me it's it's ExpressJS, so it's likely to be true. That's that's where you sort of start connecting the dots. And um, I think the the important thing to note about some of these uh, uh, Node.js or uh, uh, sites that are built with JavaScript is um, so if you'll know more about this, there's an app JS or you know there's a JS bundle that comes in, which subsequently loads or constructs the rest of the DOM tree. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through at least a couple of uh, things that I've run into where um, at least when the first HTML comes in, there's actually nothing in the DOM tree. Uh, once the JavaScripts come in, they construct the rest of the DOM tree, which means that some of these tools can give you misleading results, but it's important to just keep them in mind and, and work uh, around them. So where can so, you see where the DOM, DOM tree is getting created in this? Is that something that the visualization is showing anyone? Yes. So, um, I, you know, the way to look at this visualization is the first one, it's actually the HTML. Um, because we know that the first resource is always the HTML. Yeah. Um, everything that comes after that is actually color coded and it is going to help in the construction of uh, both the CSS object model and the document object model. So I think, uh, all of these resources um, are, you know, primarily JavaScript, and I think there's a one signal um, SDK of sorts. Um, then there are fonts. So all of these get downloaded. Uh, they're needed to either construct uh, the CSS object model or the document object model. Um, and uh, once the DOM is complete, um, you know, your page is uh, fully constructed, and that. You know, you don't have to wait until the DOM is fully constructed. I think, uh, you know, uh, browsers are able to sort of start rendering depending on how you laid out the different resources on your page. So I think that's why it's important to get your head session right. If you have your uh, critical CSS and, you know, the, the JavaScript in there, it's able to download it straight off the bat and, and start rendering content on the on the page. It's the count so, of the number. So one of the things that I always try to look at in a result like this uh, uh, is uh, two, three things, and and it would be great if you can tell tell us a little bit more about them. One is the number of resources that are being requested, or the distinct number of requests that are being made. Uh, are they all intentional? Are 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 they all the things that we designed for, or we created? Was it? Uh, are or are any of them uh, just happening without our knowledge at all? Uh, and that generally means that it's something that we have completely overlooked or we have accidentally included something 
or some script further calling in some script and there is a pot potential scope for optimization there so one is just auditing uh, all the requests that are being made are they the ones that we actually intended uh, for the resource to be loaded is that's one thing that we do uh, and uh, also looking at the number of count of resources that are getting loaded the other thing that i take a look at if you just scroll uh, down a bit uh, right at the top uh, no the other other, other way <laughs> the other down <laughs> yeah the, 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 these numbers take like the first view and the when does it start rendering what is the speed index and all these are certain numbers we also take a look at uh, so would you uh, comment on these two points that the number of resources and uh, these numbers yeah so i just opened up the chrome uh, version of the of the same test um, chrome has uh, you know some additional metrics which which make it more interesting for conversation so yeah. um, when we ran this web page test we did two things one is um, we assume that your browser is you know has never visited this site and it's going to visit new you know the site for the very first time uh, what is performance or how does page load at that point in time as you can imagine when you're going for the absolute first time every content has to be uh, fetched from the network there's there's nothing yes. available on browser cache so <clears throat> that usually means it's going to take a little longer so that's called the first view and um, you know in in the test itself uh, when i was running it there's something called the repeat view which means okay once you visited the site uh, what happens when you when you go to the same site again and i'll I'll just give you the you know high level overview for the first view it takes about 6.7 seconds for the site to load for the repeat view it's 2 seconds what that means is um, in these 2 seconds uh, or rather the, the additional the, the delta of 4.5 uh, seconds that that exists between these two things are required to fetch content which is now locally cached on the browser which is not going to change these are things like your images css javascript they don't change immediately in most situations there are situations where it can be dynamic it, it may not be cached uh, on the browser but we leave that as an outlier in most cases it can be cached and your browser never has to make that request again unless you you clear browser cache or go to an incognito window but <clears throat> that will give you an understanding of you know once a user has come into your site uh, when he is navigating between your different templates uh, what the page performance is and that's important like for example once i go to a publishing site a newspaper um, and i you know have to let's say click on the first story and then the story opens up it's it's important for you know you to use common resources so that um, the subsequent pages open up much faster so all of these are optimizations speaking of which i think um when when you're looking at you know these different optimizations there are a few things that you have to keep in mind um i think we spoke about planning for bad connection straight off um always plan plan for bad connection it's important for you to you know look at uh, nav timings resource timings and and you have to keep that in mind to figure out what are the things that you as a developer or a site owner should focus on um nav timings or resource timings are like sobek mentioned what's what's at the summary section of web page test um it tells you what the first byte time is um in this case it's 2 and 1/2 seconds um you know th there's there's no real measure of whether it's good or bad in this case 2 and 1/2 seconds seems a little on the higher side but one of the things you have to keep in mind is this is a web page test it is not a real measure of performance of your website it does not reflect uh, you know these numbers don't reflect what happens in the real world so and we'll, they'll also we'll not to... be consistent a, a second load might yeah. actually give a different set of numbers completely uh yes. not not very off but uh, but there are reasons why uh, they will be off and will be good to uh, discuss that probably later in the session yes uh, in fact i have seen it you know very uh, by over 300% uh, you know in a in a matter of like a couple of minutes apart when you when you run the test so right. take all of this data with a pinch of salt these are good guidelines but not ab good absolute numbers yeah. um but let's assume that you know um, uh, these numbers however on a relative scale are fairly true and i can i can walk you through some of the examples like for example if the first byte is 2.5 2.4 seconds your start render is 400 milliseconds after that which you know tells you that content rendering takes about 400 milliseconds uh, your largest content full paint which is a core web vital um, google is actively tracking this for seo purposes is 4.5 seconds you might want to focus on that a cumulative layout shift which means once the dom is uh, uh, dom tree is constructed 
you have no visual changes on the site, which, uh, you know, is too jarring for uh, the end user. Google has made active, uh, you know, Google has actively made some changes which focus on cumulative layout shifts. And in, in this case, there's, there's hardly any uh, uh, shift in, in the layout. Uh, blocking time is again the time you know is the time that uh, all the different resources are taking, which block, uh, which are render blocking, which means until that particular script or that CSS is fully fetched and uh, parsed and uh, constructed, nothing will render on the page. Uh, that's why it's important to sort of get your critical CSS, CSS and JavaScript in the head section itself. Um, and just for the benefit of the audience here, I just want to add over here that uh, all resources that are added to a page can be added in two different manners. One manner in which first you must load all resources, only then the page will start showing up. Or there is another technique through which you can load and say, start showing up the page and slowly on the background, keep loading the, the non-critical things. Uh, so this total, uh, the, 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 uh, the time that it takes, the blocking resource time that it takes, you would want it to be as low as possible. And, and if there is any scope for cutting down any resource and make it uh, uh, load asynchronously or in a deferred manner, that should be the way to go. Uh, and, and I guess uh, this, uh, is there any benchmark for these numbers, uh, uh, Satya? Is, uh, can you just provide any benchmark or direction for these numbers? Or what makes it turn green or red in this tool? So. That's a good question. It, uh, these web vitals are purely driven by Google and Google gives you guidelines. Um, what I'll do is I'll just walk you through something called Chrome user experience report, um, you know, and, and that will give you a good, uh, you know, um, spread of how Google perceives these numbers. Um, they, they keep tweaking how, you know, uh, these uh, different metrics affect your um, page speed scores and, and uh, from a Google's perspective, how how effective or how uh, fast your site is. And they tweak all of the, uh, the, the percentage or the weightage of a lot of these metrics. Um, and it often changes with time. Um, and I, I think it's available. Uh, it's available. Uh, I don't know if it's public information. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, there's a uh, public, uh, there's a question that is coming from uh, YouTube, uh, Satya, which is, uh, wanted to confirm, does these uh, run and create reports uh, for only the landing page or for the whole app? Or does it one needs to go into specific URLs in order to get reports for each of the pages? Okay, that's a good question. Um, this will only create a report for, um, you know, the homepage or uh, newsroundreadcom slash. Um, so nothing else. <clears throat> And um, it's important that uh, it's important to know that um, you know sometimes you might have an infinite scrolling web page, um, but that's predicated on the fact that you're able to pass an input and and scroll to a particular point before uh, subsequent content loads. Um, the web page test will not be able to provide any of those inputs, so it's it's actually just going to be uh, you know uh, fetch and execute. Okay, so um, that, you know that that gives you a little bit of an idea on the waterfall itself. Um, you can do a full blown, you know, full blown performance audit to understand, uh, you know, what are the what are the things that you should focus on uh, between web page test and your dev tools. Uh, it, it, these are two powerful options, um, and and both give you information that's. Um, specific and, and, you know, sometimes easily consumable uh, either in web page test or Chrome Dev Tools. So I um, like web page test because um, it's, it's web based, it's, it's, it's easily shareable. Um, mm -hmm. And outside of the waterfall, uh, there are a few other things that you need to pay attention in um, the web page test tool, right? Second one that I quickly want to draw your attention to is the connection view. Now connection view, essentially tells you how many connections does your site really make. Um, and an easy way to look at this is how many third party content or how many subdomains actually unique subdomains get loaded on your site and how many of uh, HTTP connections the browser has to make uh, to you know, fetch all the resources. 
And in this case, there are about 25. I would say 25 is not too bad, not not small either. It's 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 about you know somewhere in the middle. I've seen sites with a lot more uh, connections. I've seen sites with a fewer as well. But what's important is in this timeline, if you look at um, the connection for news laundry, um, a lot of the content actually comes from uh, www.newslaundry.com or feastype.com. I think the site uses Quintype, so Acetype is the subdomain for uh, Quintype. And between um, you know the newslaundry.com and the Acetype.com, almost all res resources get downloaded. Um, the rest of it is all third-party content. So <clears throat> that's a good indication of you know, how your site is constructed and how the resources are coming in. Um, again, if you want to dig a little deeper, you can you can figure out, you know, before start tender, what are the things that actually go in? Um, we saw two HTML connections, you know, in the waterfall, uh, and uh, it was that, yeah, um, and that shows up, you know, in your before start tender the, the request details as well. So you can actually figure out, you know, what this is since this is an HTML, it should render, you know, some text and you can this is how you basically dig down and figure out what exactly is happening if you've not built your built the site yourself if you built it if you probably already know html is coming is it like uh, uh, must be an iframe or something right which yes. further pulls in a second thing yeah. yeah because ordinarily you'll never see two html's like un under usual circumstances you should never see two html's uh, 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 at least in for the most part we, uh, i don't uh, which is why I was curious. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, I think some of the other things are, you know, the, the performance review. Um, it's it's just a quick visual, uh, you know, table, which tells you, um, you know, that that you're using connections. Now, uh, the, we saw in the earlier connection section that uh, the connections are getting reused, right? Now. The site is set up the right way, but let's say you know there was some issue with the way the headers are set, and there was a you know connection close directive getting passed with every resource. Um, what you would see is you know that one key polite is is not uh, you know is not set, and two in the connection view you'll see multiple connections in 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 this table. So you would see that for every resource, there's there's a there's a row, which means that uh, every that for getting a single resource, a new connection is made. So this <laughs> view is also good to figure out if your connections are being used uh, efficiently. So so the place where we see multiple connections to that some one of the Google things uh, in, is uh, yeah yeah the seven rows have seven to eleven. Is that, does that mean that uh, this is the problem exists here, or are there different domains? No. So these are OSCP stapling uh, requests. You, I've seen them um, in Firefox a lot. In Chrome, I don't see them. Uh, these are. So let me explain this call. This one is a special call. You can ignore it for the most part. You've not included it as part of uh, your site at all. It's something that okay. the browser. It's a call that the browser, browser generates. Makes. Generates. Okay. Got it. Yes, it's to verify that your SSL, that the, the SSL certificate that your site is uh, presenting has not been blacklisted. Got so it. it's a good call, but you can just safely ignore it. Um, the ones that you want to uh, look at are the other ones. Okay. Um, uh, the other one, uh, I mean, um, connection reuse is important. Gzip compression, that's something, it's a low hanging fruit that if you miss, uh, you could pay a big performance penalty. Uh, yeah. I can quickly walk you through what this is. Now, every resource, um, now we saw that uh, this particular site has a lot of JavaScript. Now, this JavaScript is compressed in the sense it's, it's gzip compressed when it's getting transferred. So the bytes downloaded is 10 KB, but it gets uncompressed by the browser and it's uh, 41 KB when it's uncompressed. Now it's important to get that compression ratio on the wire. Otherwise you're transferring more content in slower connections. It makes a situation much worse. And right. this is probably the, the lowest hanging fruit. You should always enable uh, gzip compression for 
uh, text content, um, some font types. Um, I think the web fonts are compressed by default, so you don't have to enable them for web fonts, but uh, some of the other ones, like for example, if you have any text records, HTML, uh, JSON, XML, all of that should be compressed. Yeah. <clears throat> um, images, I think image compression is a topic in itself. Um, what I would like to show you is uh, there's, a, there's a neat little um, utility available on web page test, which is called image analysis. Um, and you know it, it goes through all of the images on your site and it tells you if you were to optimize these images, what would it look like? Okay, and you know um, this particular image analysis, you would see that it's it's showing that there are only six images. Uh, this is a little bit of tidbit that I wanted to quickly share. Now, this is because the image analysis tool is going to fetch the HTML, parse the HTML for image links directly, and try to uh, you know optimize those images. The way the site is built is the HTML loads, then there is a JavaScript, which in turn pulls um, you know, the images. That's why it doesn't get picked up. Basically the lazy images, loading. Um, lazy loading, um, there are different ways to do lazy loading, but these are um, elements that are specifically loaded JavaScript by code. JavaScript. JavaScript, yeah. yeah, got it. Okay, uh, we can we can go over one of the other examples where uh, you can see image optimization. <laughs> um, the other thing that's uh, low hanging fruit is caching on the browser. Now, compression, image optimization, and browser caching. Uh, these are all, you know, at least the, the compression, connection keep alive, and uh, uh, browser caching is driven by HTTP headers you must set the right cache control header so that it's cached by the browser. We spoke about the first view and repeat view. You wanna make sure that in the repeat view, you know, if, if a resource is supposed to be available in the browser, it is, and you don't make uh, an unnecessary request for that. And um, web page test actually gives you a good, you know, indication of where you are on all of these. Like, uh, yeah. you know, you can ignore the security score, but First byte, it's, it's going to tell you that, oh, you know what, first byte is uh, a little high, maybe you have to pay attention do, to it. Do explain and that's what's first byte. Do explain what's first byte. This is something that uh, I play a lot, uh, pay a lot of emphasis to in my work. Okay. So first byte is like, for example, you know, I, I go to the site, uh, any site for that matter, uh, when, you, when you go to it, you're making a request. You're, so the first thing that happens is the DNS resolution then a TCP connection is established, an SSL handshake takes place. You make a request for that particular page or a resource, and the server actually sends the content back. Now, the content can be sent back in a single, uh, you know, uh, response, or it's segmented and sent, you know, in multiple packets. Um, the important thing is when the first packet arrives at your browser, uh, you're essentially measuring the latency for the request to go out from your browser and, and for the server to respond. It's a good indication of the network uh, related issues between the end user and the server. And that's uh, time to first byte. And, and I would also add also the page generation speed. Uh, essentially, if your time to first byte is up, uh, there are possibly yeah. two issues uh, that are there. Either you're not uh, doing a fast enough or, a, or, or you don't have enough optimized things uh, inside the backend of, uh, of your server to generate the page. Maybe you're not caching internally in your server itself or every time the PHP kicks in or the database connections kick in and all and it takes a lot of time. Or the second part is the amount of time it takes to travel, uh, the, the bytes take to travel to the server. For that, you can try to as much eliminate by picking the right server location uh, while you're running the web page test. Yeah, yeah. But it's important to remember that you know while you're running web page tests, you can cha change the server locations. Your end users are fixed, and your server, your actual application is fixed in your data center. So it's important to sort of optimize for it. Uh, it's it's a critical uh, you know uh, metric that everyone should pay attention to and optimize. Um, and um, you know I think um, the other thing that uh, web page test tells you is uh, CDN detected. If you're using a content delivery network, uh, it's able to detect. I think we spoke about this in the last session. Um, it, it looks at the DNS and the way DNS resolution happens to detect whether it's a CDN. Um, I'll, I'll quickly move on to some of the interesting ones, right? Um, if you're a website owner, sometimes you don't know or 
maybe uh, you know it, it works both ways. If you're part of the dev team, uh, your ops team or your marketing team might include uh, third-party content that you're not sure of, uh, or you don't know what it is, um, and you want to just figure out what are all the third-party content and, and you know how is it affecting your page performance. Um, the page test gives you a good indication of that. Uh, it'll, it'll first list out all the third-party content that sort of uh, go into a site or uh, goes into a renting of a page. And uh, it, it gives you both the number of requests uh, to the different domains and how much of a page weight that these different uh, domains contribute to. A good example of this is like, for example, we saw that um, this site had a lot of uh, JavaScript coming from feasettype.com, images coming in from feasettype.com. Um, that, that's indicated over here. One third of the website comes from there in terms of bytes um, and in terms of the number of requests. Right? So that's a that's a good uh, indicator. There was another pie chart to content breakdown. Yeah, yeah. This. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, but but the, the, there was another pie chart that you had very briefly looked at, which would break down between images and JavaScript and what are the different types of resources. That was on some other page, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, yes, uh, that's the content breakdown itself. Um, at the bottom can, of that, oh yeah, yeah, over here. Yeah, so, yeah, you can see that at least this particular site for 50% JavaScript, we can look at, you know, some of the other sites, right? Let me quickly uh, you know, pull um, the other sites that that we'd run some tests on, right? But none of these measures are necessarily good or bad. They are just for, I, I would say you, you would benchmark yourself the first time and, and then see how you can keep optimizing over a period of time. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I, I think, um, you know, every site owner or, or uh, you know, the technical team picks a stack and sometimes your stack drives how your content breakdown is or uh, how the resources are delivered to you. Uh, sometimes you might use a third party. Uh, that third party could be WordPress. It could be, you know, uh -huh. uh, a CMS that that you're using, um, and that platform drives how um, you know your sites are rendered and loaded. So you have little control over it, but it's important to understand how they've set it up so that you can make good decisions based on uh, based on the text. I, I I would kind of disagree with the fact that you have little control over that bit. I think uh, as long as you have awareness. Uh, of what kind of implications, especially if you're talking about technologies that are self-hosted, right? Uh, and I, I would say even today, a large number of them are still in a, running in a self-hosted way. Uh, and, and you have control over the entire stack. It's just that you, uh, because you're using, a, a, it's, it's like saying I'm, use, I'm building my site on top of a certain platform. Uh, your platform choice can be based out of uh, some of these metrics firstly, and then within the platforms also, most of these, I, I don't consider any of these technologies to be necessarily underperforming. Uh, no matter yeah. which is your choice of CMS, which is your choice of backend technology. Uh, the reason you have heard of it because they have already stood the test of quality, a lot of great implementations out there in the wild. Uh, so they ha they can be tweaked to make them performant. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, sometimes the awareness is lacking, which is why you don't dig deeper in, in this. And that is where these tools come in a, uh, and make it very uh, useful for you to question why is it like this? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and and because of lack of awareness, you tend to misconfigure it or not use it the right way, and and that sort of aggravates the problem. Right. Okay. So, I think another important thing that um, you know you might run into is. Uh, Third party content, right? Like we saw these different domains. Okay, you're back in the first site only. Okay, go on. Yeah, and I'm just picking, uh, you know, ju just uh, any of these tests to illustrate the point. Um, now, these sites have third party content. You mentioned, I think you brought up a great point. If if it's a self hosted solution, you always have control over it. I, I agree with that. But for example, you know, uh, it's, it's a well known fact that you have no control over it how Facebook runs their site or Google runs their uh, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. The only control you have is you not include the third party content. And at some point of time right now, you and Apple is saying that we'll block many of these things for you. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of important and, and uh, to understand what really happens to your site when one of the third party, you know, 
providers or services that you're using goes down. And this yeah. can be, you know, even simple things like, for example, if you're using jQuery on your site, which is critical for your site to function, but you're not using that jQuery from your own domain or your own server is not renting that you're using some other uh, service to include jQuery, you might just want to understand what the implications are or measure the risk. Uh, WebHSS actually gives you a good way to do that. So right now, Beginning. I mean, in, this, uh, in the last screen itself, it was very interesting. Just two external resources were taking up so many bytes uh, in the in the last report that we over here. Just two, one the font and the other is a, uh, some some YouTube embed. I right, probably if you add up, that's about seventy percent of the byte size that that gets added. Yeah, it's yeah a lot. Like the percentage breakdown, the pie chart is from where I was picking up the. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, like there's a 32 percent of the YouTube and 42 percent of the Google fonts. Oh no, this is 42 percent is the hard copy. The the color coding uh, then probably is there in the second page. Yeah, it's seven percent of uh, the fonts. But I think anyways, yeah, it's important to sort of understand what the implications are. Like, you know, you can you can safely assume that some of uh, the the big providers, you know. Uh, try and ensure that their services are always up and running. But internet is prone to failure. Things can go wrong. Um, and as as a business, you want to make sure you understand the risks. It's 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 important to just understand them. Whether and you want to mitigate There's an audience not, question out there. Uh, Satya, there's an audience question. I just do want to uh, complete, uh, add one note to caveat to your thing, uh, that you can always trust a big organization to eventually incorporate all the performance. Uh, benchmarks because as a big organizations also are slow uh, because they ha they are, they are slow in adopting to change they are slow in making certain changes uh, most recent like uh, you would often funnily find many of the recommendation that a company like Google makes it itself is unable to follow them at an own websites that they are creating uh, so adopting those changes uh, because are done by absolutely like People who are setting the benchmarks are different than people who are adopting these benchmarks, and and it's hard for a large product to adopt them. So, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, eventually they will get it right. Uh, but sometimes you can stay ahead of the curve by not including some of the external resources from them as well. Uh, the question from the external side, uh, uh, audience, uh, from the audience that has come in again from R Lawrence, is that uh, so? What kind of strategy or tools you follow or use? Because uh, in most of the cases, landing pages are lightweight and let's say dashboard, which is usually heavy in terms of JavaScript payload and other assets. Uh, so what kind of strategy? What if you want to, okay, this is a separate question. What kind of strategy would you follow in terms of, I assume uh, the, the, audience, uh, the audience member is trying to ask uh, as a ratio of JS versus other assets. Uh, how, what kind of strategy should be a good measure? Is there a benchmark that the your content breakdown or the mime type breakdown should or ideally look like this something so i, I think the 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 ideal response should just have html with uh, inline css and javascript but it's not feasible um, because it's not maintainable um, and and you know you, you don't want to put everything in in the same page um, you cannot reuse it across different pages and so on but there are a lot of uh, uh, considerations that go into it. I think one of the patterns that, that we used to follow a couple of years back was if it's a small JavaScript or a CSS, inline it. I think with HTTP2, that consideration has significantly gone down. You don't really care about, uh, you know, having too many requests because HTTP2 has a good, you know, pipelining mechanism. Uh, you don't have a number, you don't have a limitation on the number of parallel connections that a browser can make and, and so on. So I think a lot of improvements have, have sort of come in. Um, we will see that uh, the, the, from a protocol perspective, there is continuous advancements being made and we have to worry about some of those things, uh, you know, as developers, we don't have to worry about some of those things uh, increasingly. Having said that, um, you have to also ensure that, you know, from a performance standpoint, you can you can tweak a few things. Uh, if you're using JavaScript, uh, try and ensure that you do some amount of code splitting. Ensure that whatever the page really needs is the only thing that gets loaded on the page. Um, and if you do code splitting and, and you know CSS, if you if you refactor it well and, and split it up the right way, 
it'll, it's still available, it's still modular. You can include it in different pages as and when it's needed. And whatever parts of the code uh, you're not using, you don't include them. I think that's um, a good measure of how you would go about it, rather than trying and you know have a goal for what needs to be done in JavaScript, what needs to be done in CSS. Because I think so we can probably um, talk more about this. A lot of stuff that you can do on JavaScript can also be done on CSS, especially if it's animation. There are more than one ways to do it, uh, right. more than one ways to display the content. So I, I don't think there is one size fits all. Two more questions, uh, Satya. Uh, uh, Lawrence also add, adds this question, which is, what if you want to monitor and test specific part of an application? So if you have okay. an application and you want to monitor only a small part of the application, can you? how, how do you do it? It's a great question. So the, there are a lot of, um, okay, application monitoring essentially falls into two big buckets, right? Um, you might want to start off by monitoring your backend infrastructure. So you start measuring your server times and uh, how how your servers are renting, uh, how they're getting to different resources. That's that's a question in itself. But if you focus on the the front end, as in how do you measure a portion of your application from a browser standpoint, um, you can actually uh, go as granular as a single URL if if um, you know you want to do that, or uh, let's say you know, provided it is public, right? Provided it is public. Yes, uh, provided it's public. And um, I'm just going to take an example, right? Um, we, we'll just use uh, this site as an example. Uh, uh, you know, you just want to measure, and and uh, we'll we'll make some broad assumptions. Let's say that this media section itself uh, is is loaded of uh, is rendered by calling a separate API. It's called load media API. And um, you want to just measure the performance of that. Uh, you would start off by, you know, monitoring those endpoints and <clears throat> monitoring the resource timings. There are RUM tools available which offer custom timers. And there are lots of RUM tools available in the market. There are open source options available, which will allow you to, uh, you know, set custom timers. Um, and these custom timers work well with. Uh, you know the the resource APIs that the browser offers, so it's actually consistent across different browsers, and you will be able to monitor certain sections of the website if if that was the question. But if okay. the question is more towards how do you you know measure microservices, the approach is slightly different. All right, right, okay. So uh, another question that the audience uh, Mira has asked, uh, which is, is there a way to test performance of pages with form or uploads? Um. Yes, uh, uh, yes, there are. Um, so basically, when you're making, um, you know, a post call. Um, so uh, by the way, Mira, in just in case you want to, because I see that you are in uh, Zoom. Uh, in case you want to uh, ask the question directly to Satya and discuss it uh, quickly, uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask. Satya, you can carry on. You can continue answering the question. Sure. So. Uh, if if the question was specifically how do you test a form uh, submit on web page test, web page test is actually very flexible. Uh, you know you can you can script um, when you're entering a URL. Essentially, you're making a get call. You can technically make a post call. Uh, you just need to figure out. How, I mean, there's documentation available, uh, which is also in in the link, and uh, you can just figure out how you want to uh, you know submit. The specific parameters in the right format and stuff like that. But you're essentially, uh, you know, uh, playing around with the advanced options available in web page test. But that's just one tool. Um, typically, you would use uh, a synthetic testing tool, which allows you to monitor or rather make post calls, uh, which is mostly the case. If it's a form, put calls. If it's a custom form, to create a new record and and so on. Uh, but tools are available. Uh, my recommendation is if you truly want to test uh, you know, the, the performance of a form submit, um, you should run a distributed test and it should have more than one user because that's essentially what uh, production use cases tend to be like. You're never going to have a single user only and they're usually distributed and you need to figure out how um, uh, these requests behave at different points in time. So I would say run the same test, uh, you know, iteratively uh, with a five minute, 15 minute or a 60 minute interval uh, throughout a three weeks time span to get some sense of 
what this release looks like. If you have faster releases, you'll just shorten that cycle, but um, you know, the, the principle holds true. You want to keep running those tests from different agents uh, over uh, fixed intervals. Uh, okay, Satya, I'll also do a quick time check at this point of time. Uh, I, I don't know what are the other things that you plan to cover at this po point of time. There is also a rum related question that is there. Uh, I'm not taking it up immediately. Whenever you want to enter that segment, I would like to start with that question. Uh, so, okay, uh, I actually had... What are the other okay, things ahead. you want to cover, cover at this point of time? Then just let me know. So, I mean, um, I was talking about single point of failure. I'll, I'll, I'll close this off. So we were talking about how, you know, almost all sites have some third party content. Um, WebPixis allows you to, you know, simulate single points of failure in a sense. You can, you can, you, in, in this case, what I've done, um, and I can show you what I've done. Um, I've uh, simulated a failure for, um, Also, tell us how you do what you we have, we have just done. How do you create a single point of failure? Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, what you essentially do is when you're starting a test, um, there is a there is a box for single point of failure. Now, in this site, uh, I think this was uh, news laundry. We had uh, the hard copy uh, the page test uh, as well. And one of the things we, what you're essentially looking for is try and identify all the third party domains that, you know, a particular website uses. And you want to figure out, okay, what happens if let's say, you know, the facebook.com, um, the, the site goes down. So I have plugins probably for a login or tracking from Facebook. What happens when they go down? Will my site work? Will there be issues with, with you know, loading it? And essentially, what you have to do is just enter, uh, you know, these different host names uh, in the SPOF uh, text area, okay. and you submit the test. And that so what you will run. What you what you're doing is you're saying you're black. Uh, uh, you're you're kind of ex excluding a particular set, either a single or multiple set of domain names to fail. Uh, so th yes. any request to those domains will not succeed. And then yes. what happens? And and so you're almost simulating that like uh, like there is another site that we saw where there were about 25 different uh, domains that were being called, uh, resources being called from 25 different domains. If any one of them fails or any two of them fails because you don't have control over all these external resources, then what happens? That's the yeah. what if scenario. Okay, so what happens then? So um, in, in this case, you know, um, we saw that when you fail the Google, Facebook uh, domains for uh, you know the different tracking plugins and Google Analytics, and you fail the fonts, um, essentially uh, you know the site visually loads. Uh, but if you look at the the nav timings for that particular test, or you know from a browser standpoint, uh, the document complete is going to take. 49 seconds and, and this will be sort of reflected in your metrics as well. But it's important to know that even in case of failure, visually this this uh, particular site just looks fine. Uh, and, and you can see that by going through the print strip and- uh, Manages to load that, the entire thing. Yeah, it, 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 you know, there's no, there's no significant difference. There's a slight shift in uh, when the site starts rendering the content. But that slight difference is so small that I wouldn't be able to say if it's because but of why the would, of uh, why, why would the load time increase to 49 seconds? Why, why would such a thing happen? Okay, so typically what happens is a browser will try, you know, when, when it fails fetching a content, and, and this happens for all the content, a browser automatically will try to retry that particular connection, uh, that particular request. Uh, before retry kicks in, the first request has to fail. Uh, now, for the first request to fail, it takes a while. And uh, that's essentially what the simulation does. Uh, it fails the request, but it, it, it doesn't fail it immediately. It has to wait for the connection timeout, and, and that's when the failure happens. All of this cumulatively adds up. If you have three retries uh, from the browser, essentially you're waiting for three timeouts before which the browser gives up. Um, so that's essentially you know what, what typically happens. And um, you can actually see that, um, you know, when when 
when there is a failure you'll see so that so you're saying that on many has... in many sites uh, a failure might end up uh, in leaving the 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 visual rendering also in a broken state yes that is something you need to sort of test for just to make sure that you know you're uh, mitigating the risks all right okay and um we spoke a lot about rum um, rum data um i just Should I start cover... with the question should I start with the question on the RUM, uh, RUM thing? Because there's someone, uh, uh, Venki Shetty has asked, what is the recommended way to measure real-time web performance experienced by end users across devices and networks? That's a great starting question for RUM. Okay, so uh, typically, you know, um, we, we'll hold on to the real-time aspect of it because um, there are, yeah. I think uh, it's, it's a logistical challenge, but, Essentially, if you want to measure performance for any given website, uh, you want to measure what your end users are experiencing on your website. Uh, you can you can simulate it. Uh, you can run backbone tests uh, all day long, but those are synthetic tests. And by that, what I really mean is um, your test agents or uh, nodes that are simulating the test are sitting in data centers with very, very good quality internet connections. They don't uh, have any disruptions. There's no, uh, you know, congestion on those networks. Real networks um, have, you know, issues. I had a path at the beginning of the session. So actually what happened was my internet reset. So I switched to, uh, you know, a different connection. And in those scenarios, what happens? Zoom was able to uh, work just fine. You have to just make sure similar to that, um, you know, in poor conditions, your site also works well. The way to do, way to gather this data is by getting the map timings from the browsers. As a standard, all browsers today uh, have map timing APIs, which um, real user monitoring tools sort of plug into to gather the data. And it's consistent across browsers. I think that standardization has, uh, has happened is a good thing for um, all of us. And <clears throat> What you want to do is sort of use that RUM data, collect it, um, and depending on the size of your site, you might be sampling it because uh, you know if 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 your site is not uh, very uh, largely visited, then you potentially can get all the data samples. Google Analytics, as an example, samples roughly at around one percent, um, and even a one percent sample is statistically very relevant. Uh, especially in large demographies like India, there are millions of users coming in. You know, 1% is a lot of data. It gives you good indication. And a, a good segue into that is, um, you know, the next thing I was going to talk about. Um, that's the Chrome user experience uh, data set. And uh, it's called the Crux DB. Quick, so basically, quick time check before you get into this. Uh, we would like to close by 12.30. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to drop in your comments on YouTube or here so that we can take the final ones. I, I assume this is the final segment that uh, Satya will be covering in this uh, talk. Perfect. One yeah. thing we could yeah. do at the end of the session is also to see if we want to do a continuation at some point. Uh, uh, sure. Partners can also chip in. May, uh, continuation as in uh, right now, right after this, or or in a no, follow-up no. session? No, as a follow-up session. Uh, okay, sounds, 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 sounds great. So uh, as uh, Satya enters this last segment, if any of you feel that uh, there should be further, more advanced sessions, uh, further digging into what are the uh, uh, specifics available, uh, what are the, any specific things you want us to cover in a greater detail, uh, because this is a very general overview, as you can see, there's so much you can cover in a one hour session or a one and a half hour session. Uh, so please drop in your thoughts and comments here as well as uh, on uh, hasgeek.com slash content web. I'll also announce this once at the end. So Satya, please continue. Yeah, so a good um, you know, source of data if you're not already using a RUM tool on your website. Um, by that, you know, you're not using Google Analytics or you know, a similar uh, tool that measures end user performance that can be MPELS or um, boomerang that's open source or, or something else. Um, in the absence of such tools, um, users who are using Google Chrome as a browser can opt in to sort of send uh, data to Google 
And Google makes our data set publicly available. It's called the Chrome User Experience uh, Report or data set. That's publicly available and it's free to use. Um, almost all sites eventually, in some sample, make it, depending on who's sending that data back to Google. And this is public information. And um, I, I, what I can do is I can um, put in steps on how you can create a crux, you know, a report for your site. Um, you know, on the HasGeek page. Uh, what I did, it, it takes a few seconds to create. I've created, uh, you know, some, some pre-made uh, dashboards for uh, uh, the site. <clears throat> so, okay. So what uh, this Crux report shows you is, is actually what Page Insight uh, gives you. But it's not simulated. It's not running from a single agent. It's actually gathered information from actual end users, and it has some amount of historical data as well. Just to you know, quickly run through some interesting data points that I found. Uh, if you look at time to first byte, um, you might want to keep track of time to first byte historically. Like, is my site doing better over time, worse over time? Do I, you know, it, for for whatever reason, accumulation of technical debt. Is my site progressively getting slower because I've added, you know, uh, some plugins, some uh, third-party content over time, and I've not clean cleaned it up? And this gives you a good indication. So, time to first byte, like uh, Sovik mentioned, is the time, you know, which which is both the network part and the server generating the individual web pages. Um, over time, if you know your servers are getting loaded, you would see that time to first byte goes, you know, downhill. In this case. It's, it's doing fairly well. I think this is consistent. Like I said, this is a very, very small sample. Um, so take all of this data with a pinch of salt. Now, if you look at, um, you know, uh, DOM load, uh, DOM content loaded, again, you see that, uh, you know, compared to October uh, 2019, um, you know, there's been a great improvement. Uh, DOM load is less than 1.5 seconds as of July 4th about 50% of the sample users, which is great. Um, in October, it was about 20%. And um, I think there are some other interesting data points as well. Uh, this one is really great, right? The first paint. Um, you know, when you look at this data set, you can, you can almost tell that there was a significant change. I don't know what the change was, but there was a change uh, that happened between December and January, and, and that change uh, further uh, was rolled out in Fred that improved the first paint time on the site, which means some template was changed, the way content was rendered on that page was changed. So uh, the, 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 the RUM data is actually very critical to understand, um, you know, what kind of end users are coming in, uh, what the performance is on, on your site. Um, like for example, even if you want to, you know, understand where are my end users coming in from, what should I focus on? Like for example, on this site, um, you can see that 93% of the users in this Crux data set are coming in from, uh, you know, mobile devices. That means you have to focus on your mobile uh, website more than you focus on your desktop website. So things like that are actionable. Um, you can, you know, figure out where to spend your time and resources on, um, provided your site is live and <laughs> it's got a significant uh, sample size. These data sets are very actionable. But it's not a replacement for RUM tools. You should have your own RUM tool. Your Google Analytics data would probably, you know, uh, be a little different from this. And while this is a good place to start, RUM tools will give you those insights so that you can you can make actionable decisions. I think um, those are some of the things I wanted to cover. Um, and Sarvik mentioned that a, a lot of these topics I've just skimmed through uh, because a lot of these topics are fairly advanced. Um, like, you know, earlier uh, we mentioned web page tests and Chrome Dev Tools. I think that in itself, it, you know, is is a very vast topic. So if you have any specific questions, uh, you can post it and we, we can probably take it. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Satya. Uh, so Satya has uh, uh, promised uh, even on the video and even before the video that uh, he'll tell us steps how to reproduce a uh, the Chrome user experience report like this, something like that for uh, your own website. Uh, I, in my opinion, this is great because not everyone has the knowledge or the technical skills uh, or even the bandwidth 
to set up their own RAM tools. Uh, and especially because in RAM tools, you not only have to do the monitoring, but you also have to do the data collection. And then you have to figure out a way to process it. There are definitely more and more tools coming up, which can make their li your life easier. But at any point of time you set up, you're going to only need six more months to see a report like this. But uh, something like this, they, because they have historical report, you can see trends of how you're getting better or worse uh, 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 in, in over a period of time. Uh, but this is this was a very insightful uh, uh, session, uh, at least for me, uh, Satya, and I'm, I'm sure it was for the audience as well. Uh, if there are any questions, audience, uh, uh, feel free to shoot over the next minute or so, then uh, we can take this. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll close uh, these bits. Uh, and one last question I'll ask uh, to you, Satya, before we close is, uh, what are the aspects of performance we did not touch upon at all to, in today's conversation? Do you think we, uh, we left aside certain things uh, which was beyond the focus of the tools we were talking about? One of them I can definitely tell is the server-side performance, the page actual generation uh, uh, bits as well. And I think that is one session that uh, I can uh, try to plan for in the future, which is, okay, beyond the things that can be measured from outside the system, what are the things that you can do inter internally in the server to, uh, to perform? Anything else you can think of? Um, look, I, I think um, I, I briefly spoke about this, but um, a lot of, uh, uh, the the headings or you know the overviews that the page test uh, gives you are actually vast topics in itself. For example, you know um, optimizing JavaScript and CSS. Uh, yeah. That's that's a topic on its own. Um, images they're a topic on their own. Um, I, I think um, you you can do a lot of uh, optimizations. Um, we didn't talk about how you know even the sites that we looked at in this session how they've uh, all differently handled, uh, you know, CSS, JavaScript, and images. All of them have different approaches to it, and all of them are right in their own uh, ways. So there's no one size fits all. You just need to ensure that you're getting the end result that you look at. And um, you know, the other thing that you could do is uh, sort of um, figure out what are the critical resources for your site, you know, and and figure out how you can sort of load them ahead of time. Um, you mentioned lazy loading. Um, you can sort of tweak the priority of uh, some of the requests um, in in a lot of lot of browsers. I wouldn't say all. Uh, I think uh, Safari has some challenges. On Chrome, you can definitely play around with it. Firefox, you can play around with it. So there is there are some capabilities available um, that that you should definitely use if um, uh, it, it it's it's giving you performance benefits. And after that, I think, uh, you know, even measurements, um, it, it does not require a session in itself, but it's worth talking about, you know, what's the right way to measure? What are some, how, how do you measure on an ongoing basis and take effective action and validate that, you know, it's made an impact or made a change to your site. So I think uh, all of these, you have to look at, look at them holistically. I don't think there is a silver bullet to, uh, you know, performance. Uh, right. You just have to figure out that one thing, you know, that's going to give you the maximum benefit and, and go after it. 